Very good afternoon. Um, so for the second exam, I'm almost done grading the, the exams. So you should get your feedback uh, by Wednesday. So on Wednesday, you're gonna have your, your grade and also I'm gonna be discussing the, the answers for the, for the exam questions. Um, today, what we're gonna do is we, we are gonna continue where we stop. Um, before the second exam, actually before the review for the second exam, we uh, started covering this lecture on material handling. So we're gonna go quickly over the first group of, of uh, equipment that we'll discuss before the, the exam, and then we're gonna complete the, the lecture today. So this is a long, long lecture, this uh, or long presentation has some almost a hundred uh, slides. So the idea is for you to get familiarized with, with the equipment that is commonly used in, in a facility for material handling purposes. And also for you to understand the different uh, applications for which each group of uh, material handling equipment is used. So the way I handle this discussion is by showing you pictures and then giving you some uh, discussion about some of these equipment. Um, but the idea again is that you can connect the type of equipment with the application in terms of when would you use that equipment. Uh, if you need to move stuff from one point, point A to point B, would you use a, a truck? Would you use a conveyor? We use so that's that's the idea. So the the objective for this lecture is to learn about some of the material handling equipment requirements into a facility. So we have discussed so far the design of a facility from multiple perspectives. We we talk about the location of departments, configuration of these departments. Um, also, we talk about the computing the number of machines that will be inside of specific departments. We talk about the different type of, of production um, systems. Uh, we talk about building the facility and, and specifying the requirements from, from a personal point of view. So uh, designing for the HVAC requirements, the lightning requirement, also for the personal needs of the, of the people using the facilities, so in terms of restrooms, uh, facilities for parking, uh, access to parking spaces, and so on. So now we, now that we know all those uh, areas, we also have to connect that with the equipment that will be needed to, not only to produce the, the, uh, the products or the uh, equipment or the materials or the, um, or the products that you're going to be producing, but also to transport those between areas in the facility. So this um, 
is connected to the facilities design area. So, so far we have looked at the layout design, the structural design. Now we are focusing on this third piece, the handling system design. And then after completing this discussion, uh, we have a couple of, of lectures that are gonna be focusing on conveyor design. Those are gonna come after this one. After that, we're gonna transition to the, the design of our warehouse. And then after that, we're gonna look at that uh, box at the top, which is the facility location problem. So how do you decide where to place a facility based on the uh, requirements for the company? So the components of our material handling are three. We have the materials, the move, and the method. Okay, so the materials are basically the items or the products that you're gonna be moving inside the facility. The move is a type of, of, of movement that you're gonna be making from origin, travel path, destination, frequency to be made. So all those three areas will be important in terms of deciding what type of equipment you're gonna use. And then the method. So are you gonna use equipment, people, procedures, physical facilities to make the move? So again, you have to answer this question. Um, what is the material, where and when has to be moved and what will be or how and who that's gonna be our method. And one of the screens is not working. So I don't know what's going on with this one, but the rest of them are on. And all this uh, discussion in terms of the classification of the, the equipment is based on the material handling taxonomy. And, and this is published by the College Industry Council on Material Handling Education. So in terms of material handling equipment, um, it's used for the movement and storage of material within the facility or at site, material handling equipment can be classified into five major categories. Transport equipment, which is uh, number one. And inside the transport equipment, there are four subcategories, conveyors, cranes, industrial trucks, material that can be also transported manually with no equipment. Basically with an operator can move stuff from one point to another inside the facility. Number two is the positioning equipment. Uh, this is used to handle material at a single location. So you are not gonna be transporting these to anywhere unless it, the product is completed. So that is in the correct position for subsequent handling, machining, transport, and storage. Uh, unlike transport equipment, positioning equipment is usually used for handling it at a single uh, work or workplace. Number three is the unit load formation equipment. So for example, uh, pallets, or a, a cart in which you, you have storage. So this is basically restricting the material for being to be moved. You're putting them together and then you can transport them all together as a single unit. Uh, number four, storage equipment. This is equipment used for holding or buffering materials over a period of time. Um, some storage equipment might include the transport materials, for example, the AS, uh, RS, or storage carousels. Um, if materials are block stacked directly on, on the floor, the storage equipment in, is required. So basically this is where you have a production line and you have stuff coming in in terms of materials. So you need a place to store, uh, store them until they're used. Uh, so that's where the storage equipment is, is used. And then identification and control equipment. This equipment used to collect and communicate the information that is used to coordinate the flow of materials. Um, so like RFID technology, which you have this, uh, let's say barcodes uh, link or glue to the product or to the boxes. And then you will use some scanners to get the information and decide where to move uh, that box or that product based on, on the um, barcode. So the identification materials and associated control can be performed manually with no, uh, also no specialized equipment. So if you don't want to rely, like if this is not something that you're gonna be doing pretty often, you can have a person doing the classification and the movement, but 
But if it's something that you're gonna, for example, Amazon handling a, a lot of boxes every minute, you would want would like to rely on something more sophisticated like RFID. Um, so the major subcategories of transport equipment are these four. We talked about them uh, before the, the second exam, but let's talk about them again, just for a quick review. We have four, the conveyors, the cranes, the industrial trucks, or no equipment at all. So the idea is that you, again, understand what are the differences when to use each one of those. Uh, and so, that you, so you, if you have a specific situation, you can identify the right uh, material handling equipment to use. So conveyors are equipment used to move material over fixed path between specific points. Cranes are equipment used to move material over bearable path, but you still have a restricted area. Okay, so in the conveyors, you don't have, you have a fixed path. With the cranes, you have more flexibility in terms of movement, but you still restrict it for the area that you can cover. And then the industrial trucks used to move materials over variable paths with no restrictions on the area covered. So if you want a lot of flexibility, then you will go with the industrial trucks. You can still, uh, if you can handle, like say you, you, you need some flexibility, but you still constrain with a restricted area, then a crane will be the best way to go. And then if, if you're handling a fixed path with a lot of, of movement, then the conveyor will be the best um, option. No equipment, that's always an option. You, you have to rely, or rely on, on a person to do the movement for you. So I, I show you this again. Um, the idea is that this helps you um, differentiate between the cranes, conveyors, and industrial trucks. So the cranes, you see, you have you can cover this blue area, but the area is restricted. Uh, you still have flexibility of movement within that area, but you're restricted in how much area you can cover. The industrial trucks, if you compare that with the area that is covered by the cranes, you have more flexibility in terms of coverage. And then the conveyors is just a fixed path. So you have to go through that red line uh, and that's your area of movement. So the conveyors are used where material is to be moved frequently between specific points, right? So you have a fixed area like, um, most of, of these manufacturing lines, you will have a, a process starting from point A and finishing in point B. So most of the time you would use some type of conveyor uh, to move the materials until they reach the last station. To move materials over a fixed path, then when there is sufficient flow volume to justify the fixed uh, conveyor in business. So these are very expensive uh, material handling equipment. So you want to make sure that you have a high volume uh, of products moving between those two points to justify the cost of that equipment. Conveyors can be classified in different ways, type of product being handled, if it is a unit load, or if you're moving a group of products together or a bulk load. Um, the location of the conveyor and whether or not loads can be accumulated on the conveyor. So here's a list of, of conveyors, different type of conveyors. And as I did in, in, in our previous lecture, I have some pictures for you to familiarize with, with them. Uh, so here's some, some examples. I, I mentioned some of their, their uses last time. Um, slab conveyors, those are typical in these uh, warehouses where packages are handled. Like post office, warehouses like UPS, uh, FedEx, they will have these type of conveyors uh, basically to distribute the, the boxes between the, the trucks that are going to handle them. Um, for food, we have the vibrating conveyor, which is allowing the product to be sorted in a way that you can package the, the specific amount. Um, same thing here with the screw conveyor, you're moving materials uh, up so you can accommodate within a specified area. This carrier system pneumatic conveyor is typical on these uh, bank, bank uh, car services. You have this capsule moving up and down 
from using this nomadic type of, of system. Um, these ones are uh, vertical lift conveyors. Or these are typical in warehouses like HEB warehouse. You will have some of those moving the, the products up and down the, the storage areas. Um, these conveyors we're gonna discuss in, in detail in terms of design later on, but these are trolley conveyors. These are helping uh, moving uh, high, um, sometimes big uh, boxes or high weight equipment or high weight product. Um, so this can be pro power and free conveyors. Uh, typically you will have a rail moving this uh, in a specified area or specified path. Um, sort sortation conveyors, these are typical on the airport. So you will see them um, basically separating the, the luggage uh, according to the destination or the airplane where the passenger is gonna go. So you're gonna rely on some type of RFID system to make sure that you send the luggage to specify um, um, conveyor. Uh, more sort agent, sortation uh, conveyors, uh, different applications. Again, you have to move between uh, paths. You have to rely on some type of uh, decision-making RFID technology to accommodate the direction of the, of the product in order to reach the final destination. Uh, so the cranes, as I mentioned, this gives you more flexibility than a conveyor. Now you have the, a larger area that you can cover, but still you're restricted. Uh, so this is used to move loads over variable, uh, uh, to move loads over variable paths within a restricted area. Use where there is insufficient flow volume such as that the use of a conveyor cannot be justified. Again, provide more flexibility in terms of the space uh, that you can cover or the area that you can cover and provide less flexibility in movement when you compare them uh, against the industrial trucks. So some examples, uh, I, again, these are the major type of cranes, the jeep crane, the bridge crane, the gantry crane, and the staggered crane. Um, so this is the idea, you have these, uh, Equipment, again, you have a, a, you have flexibility in terms of movement, rotation of the crane, and also you have flexibility in terms of these uh, horizontal dimension. You can move back and forward. So you can cover a large area or a restricted area using the, the crane. So there are different type of cranes. Um, so here's some example, the jeep crane, the bridge crane, this is again giving you flexibility in terms of movement. So you have these parallel uh, beams that allow you to go back and forward. And then you have this perpendicular rotation or this perp perpendicular movement that also allows you to move, uh, gives you that flexibility. This gantry train has wheels, so you can move that based on, on the location of the product. So it's not fixed, that gives you an extra benefit. Um, but there are some of them that are fixed to, to the floor. So depending again on the type of, of application that you're using. Um, and then we also discuss the industrial trucks. Again, the difference between this and the crane is that you have more flexibility in terms of the area that you can cover. Um, this is used when there is insufficient flow volume such as the user conveyor cannot be justified provide more flexibility in movement than conveyors and cranes and not licensed to travel on public roads. Commercial trucks are licensed to travel on public roads. So that's, there's, these are vehicles that are again, used specifically for uh, movement of materials inside the facility. A lot of, of different type of, of transport equipment in terms of industrial trucks. So here are the list. Uh, is it possible for you to memorize all this? So again, my, my goal is for you to be able to differentiate between the types. And then if you are deciding to go uh, and use a truck or industrial truck, then you can go in detail and see, okay, I'm on this group, which ones will be better for the application that I'm trying to design for. 
Um, but at least you have the understanding, okay, this will be a scenario better for a crane. This will be a, a scenario better for a conveyor. This is a scenario better for a truck. So here's the different type of trucks, so basic ones. Again, you have to rely on an operator to move uh, the cart. Uh, so these are frequently saw in, in different applications, like if you go to the supermarket or a sound store, you will see this uh, everywhere. And then these are, are more, um, these are designed or the ones that I'm showing here are designed to carry heavier loads. So you have the assistance of the, of the equipment now in terms of uh, lifting the materials such as the um, manual pallet jack and the power pallet jack. So you don't have to do the work of lifting the material. You can just put this under the pallet and then lift it using the equipment. And then movement is also allowed with the equipment. And now if you're not, if you want to provide that extra power in terms of movement, then you can go into these uh, trucks that are um, have their own engine. So you, you, you don't necessarily have to use your force to move of the, the product back and forward. And again, you have the gas operator, electrical operator type of vehicles. Um, AGVs, these are pretty common now in, in this warehouse, these big warehouses like Amazon, the one that we have here in San Marcos, that will rely on these AGVs to move the, uh, the racks. So every rack can be moved with one of these AGVs. And depending on the product that you need to pack, for a box, the AGV will bring the rack that is uh, accommodating or is storing that specific product to the operator that is preparing the box. So here's some examples. You see that AGV, that red AGV is basically uh, pulling those uh, that product. And you see that in, in the floor, there's a path that is followed by the AGV. Uh, so that's why keeping the, the um, the movement on specified track. So there's no uh, collision between the, the equipment. Uh, power industrial trucks. So again, these are designed to, to move heavier loads and uh, also for longer uh, areas. Um, industrial trucks provide not only a means of transporting materials, but also provide means of accurate lifting and stacking. Appropriate tooling for the trucks permit users to lift not only pallets, but a wide array of specialized loads. For example, rows of carpet are easily moved with via industrial trucks, via replacing a standard force with a different type of, of equipment, like a single tube. So these power trucks can be found in almost any manufacturing plant, loading dock, and warehouses. Uh, the internal combustion trucks have the advantage of outdoor use. They can live between 2,000 to 15,000 pounds, uh, with some specialty trucks lifting up to uh, 50 tons. They can lift up to 20 feet in height and can operate only on gasoline, LP gas, or diesel fuel. Uh, so again, if you look at the industrial trucks association classification, uh, the power trucks are classified in seven classes and they are listed here. Um, so depending again on the type of application, you will go deeper into the selection process. Uh, so for example, class one are the electric motor uh, rider trucks, class three electric motor hand truck, and so on. Um, so I think I covered this already. There's some information about the differences uh, between classes. And there's, there's some additional pictures on different classes and for the power industrial trucks. Um, so I think this is where we stopped last time. The new material was to start here. So we, we're gonna look at position and equipment now. This is used to handle material at a single location so that the material is in the correct position for subsequent handling, machining, transport, or storage. Unlike transport equipment, positioning equipment is usually used for handling at a single work 
our workplace. A material can also be positioned manually with the use of no equipment. Um, as compared to manual handling, the use of position equipment can provide the following benefits. Raise the productivity of each worker when the frequency of handling is high. Okay, so you are not relying on the skills of the operator. You have the support of this equipment to make sure that the, the product is um, well positioned so it can be uh, worked uh, correctly improve product quality and limit the damage to materials and equipment when the item handle is heavy or awkward to hold and reduces fatigue and injuries when the environment is hazardous or inaccessible. Okay, so those are advantages of having this type of equipment. Uh, positioning equipment, comparison, um, or the list of positioning equipment is here. You have dock lever, you have the ball transfer table, rotary index table, parse feeder, air film device, hoist, balancer, manipulator, and industrial robot. So here's some uh, examples. You have at the top on your left, the lift tilt turn table. So this gives you uh, flexibility in terms of positioning uh, the material or the product that you're going to work on. Uh, so also you have the rotary index table, which is also fixing the product and moving that product around the specific stations in the production uh, area. Uh, the rigid link manipulator, again, you can see that once this is providing a way of lifting, movement, but once you reach the, the correct position of the equipment, you can fix it to that position so you can continue the work. Uh, the part feeder, uh, the air film device, you can see on that one, it's letting you lift. Uh, you have a control here, and depending on where you want to place or where up to which height you want to. Uh, the, the height that you want to obtain to position the, the load. You have control over that. Um, articulated jib frame manipulator. The vacuum, same idea. Now you're, you're controlling or you're fixing the product using some type of vacuum or air pressure. And the industrial robot, this is pretty common now. You will find this and in some of the labs in the England School of Engineering. Uh, so they allow you to fix the, the bullpen of the, of the product and position them in the right location so you can continue the, the process. Uh, now in terms of unit low formation equipment, this is used to restrict material so that they maintain their integrity when handled a single load during transport and for storage. The advantages of this unit loads are more items can be handled at the same time and also enables the use of standardized material handling equipment. The disadvantages of this unit load formation equipment are that you have to time to spend forming and breaking down the unit load. So once you, it's not only movement, so you have to set up this before you move them. And then once you reach the destination, you have to break down that unit. The cost of the containers, pallets, and other load restraining materials used in the unit load, and also the empty containers, pallets may need to be returned to their original point or their original location. So they gave you this advantage of make, uh, making you able to move a big amount of product together but also you have to consider the disadvantages in terms of the equipment that you're gonna to use to hold everything together. And then what you're gonna do with that equipment on the, after you have completed the process. So some unit low formation equipment, um, we always starts with no equipment at all, which is at the top. Pallets are pretty common. So if you have seen, um, for example, in the supermarket, you will find them anywhere. 
Uh, so after you have completed the movement, they had to take those bodies and put it somewhere, some type of warehouse location. Uh, skits, slip sheets, uh, tote pants, pallet boxes, beans, cartons, bags, bulk load uh, containers, crates, intermodal containers, strapping tape glue, shrink, palletizers. So again, a, a big list of different type of unit load formation equipment. And here's some examples. Um, so the pallets, again, those are pretty common. They allow you to, uh, for that extra space at the bottom, so you can use your forklift to pick up the, the loads and move them to the destination. Um, typically, they're pretty heavy, so you need to have some type of equipment to move them. Um, the slip sheet is also another way to, to carry multiple items. The tote pants, those are pretty common in um, businesses such as, uh, I don't know, Amazon, you'll find them warehouses. Anywhere that you will have a warehouse, you'll find those, allow you to uh, restrict the, the, the product and also uh, protect the product when you are uh, movement, you have a lot of movement happening in the area. Uh, Pallet boxes, uh, skid boxes, you, you're shown here. Also these intermodal containers. These are becoming very common now um, for moving uh, companies. They will have these type of containers. They will leave them in your driveway. You will fill it out and then there will someone come and pick them up. Um, also companies will have the same type of, of process that would bring the truck with the, with, the, with the container, leave them in the facility and then uh, leave without the, the container, just with the truck. Um, robotic pick and place palletizer. These are um, again helping in terms of putting the unit loads together. Uh, sometimes they have some, um, it, it would be but for very uh, specific products. Like you see this one has a, um, some type of magnetic equipment so you can pick up and put in inside the box. Uh, this one, the shrink wrap, stretch wrap, if you go to the airport, you'll find this type of machines like uh, for luggage protection and for unit low uh, built for, for transportation purposes. And then the manual palletizing option, which you have this type of uh, crane uh, or Yes, lifting the, the pallet and then you can put that or helping the operator to place the boxes at a better height. Uh, so storage equipment, potential research, reasons for storage includes time bridging, allows products to be available when it's needed. Uh, for example, storing spare machine parts at the facility, uh, processing for some products, like for example, uh, bottles of wine. Storage can be considered as a processing operator operation because the product undergoes a required change during storage. So that would be part of the process. Uh, and securing, for example, in, in nuclear waste storage, you want to keep that, um, that product sealed. So for storage purposes. Um, so that's the third major reason. Uh, some uh, different types of storage equipment, uh, selective pallet rack, drive-through rack, driving rack, flow-through rack, pushback rack, sliding rack, cantilever rack, stacking frame, cells, storage carousel, automatic storage retrieval systems, becoming very popular now, um, split case order picking system, and a mezzanine. So here's some examples of um, pallet rack systems. Again, these are pretty common in warehouses. So the idea is that you, you can store as many, as much product as possible within the area, but also allowing space for uh, movement. So as you can see, for example, here, the, the rack is basically taking most of the space, but you still have some space for 
uh, letting that four clip go inside the, the those little eyes. <clears throat> so uh, this one, the one at the at the top, the flow through rack has some type of of um, decline, so you can pick from the uh, from this area, and then the next product will go and move towards the front. So you can load that from the back of the of the rack, the driving rack, similar to, to this one. Right now you have the that option as well. Pushback rack. Uh, you have the rails, and you have the flexibility also to move the product, as you can see here, these boxes uh, back and forward with those carts. And the sliding rack, this allows you for, again, accommodating more product inside the facility because you can move those racks back and forth depending on where the product that you want to move is located. So for example, if you want to pick up something in between racks one and two, you can move those racks to the front and then you will have the space needed for moving inside the, the rack. Uh, shelves, bean drawers, these are typical. You have a lot of tools. Um, if you're dealing with a lot of tools and, and so on, you'll have this type of storage equipment. Storage carousel, these are common for order picking processes like Amazon, for example, in which you have a lot of products and you're putting together these boxes based on um, the orders that are made by the customers. So you have the flexibility of moving the carousel base and picking up from the from a single point uh, allocation. These are also common in other service industries uh, like um, laundries, you have these uh, carousels going and moving and they will pick up your order based on the location and so on. Uh, automatic retrieving and sorting. So these are more sophisticated type of equipment. You see there's a, a, a operator and then you have the robot basically doing most of the work. So depending on the, on the request, then the robot will go pick up the, the product and then uh, put it close to the location of the operator. So these are mini load uh, automatic retrieval systems. And then here is the unit load automatic retrieval system. So these are for larger uh, products. Same idea, you have that uh, mechanism that is gonna go pick up the, the boxes or the product that you need based on the location and you wait for it. In, in a specific location. Uh, split case order picking system. This is, uh, and also the man on board automatic retrieval system. So this will take you to the location of the, of the items that you need to pick up, right? So you, the, the crane will bring you to the right location, you'll pick up and then move to the next one. Uh, same thing here you have uh, the split case uh, scenarios. Um, in terms of identification and control of equipment, this is used to collect and communicate the information that is used to coordinate the flow of materials within a facility and between a facility and its suppliers and customers. So again, mention the use of barcodes in the product radio frequency or RF tags, magnetic stripes, machine vision, uh, portable data terminal, electronic data interchangeable or internet. So all this is becoming more and more um, accessible now that we have uh, equipment, we have better internet access and so on. So companies are relying more on this type of technology to handle their uh, transportation and material handling um, needs. So as always, we start with the manual, no equipment needed, the identification of materials and associated communication can be performed manually with no specified equipment. Although it is sometimes possible to manually 
uh, coordinate the operation of material handling system, it becomes more difficult to do so as the speed, size, and complexity of the system increases. Uh, barcodes, these are again very useful, allows you to have a unique bar space pattern represented with various alphanumeric characters. Barcode system consists of a barcode labor, barcode scanner, and a barcode printer. Contact the barcode scanner you spend or want to read the labels. No contact barcode scanners include fixed beams, moving beam, and only directional. And one dimension codes are most common, but 2D codes enable more graded data storage and capability. Uh, the RF tag, this is data encoded on a chip encasing a tag. No contact can be read when the tag is within 30 feet of an antenna. So this tag can be read up to 30 feet from, from specific antenna. Task Tags can either be attached to a container or permanently or temporarily to an item. RF tags have greater data storage capability than barcodes. This type of technology is very useful and for location uh, to make decisions in terms of where you want to send the, the product and so on. But it also has a cost. So you have to look at the benefit cost ratio and see if it's a technology that is will be useful for you. Uh, the magnetic stripe, this has data encoded on a magnetic stripe that is readable in almost any environment. This one requires contact with the reader. So this will be like uh, a credit card in which you have to go and slip in order to get the information. Greater storage capability and more expensive than barcodes. A machine vision does not require explicit encoding of data since objects can be identified by their physical appearance, no contact, but typically requires structure lightning, more flexible than the other identification equipment, but is less robust. A portable data terminal, like a handheld, arm-mounted, or vehicle-mounted data storage and communication device. This communicates with a host computer via a radio frequency or inferred rank, and has a variety of input devices available, such as keyboard, barcode scanner, and a voice headset. Uh, electronic data interchangeable, EDI, or internet, this provides standards for intercorporate transfer of purchase orders, invoices, shipping notice, and other frequently used uh, business documents. Prior to the internet, the electronic data interchange required expensive dedicated value added networks or VANs. So that has changed with the, uh, again, the use of the internet. EDI is critical for implementing just in time manufacturing which we have discussed before, which is the pool uh, manufacturing process in which we design for, or we produce for the orders that we receive. We don't produce for storage. Um, decided on picking medium in picking operations as part of warehousing. So this basically, again, you have to put together a, a group of products or a group of parts to, produce a specific product. This is what we call a picking operation. So you have a way of collecting all the pieces and then you bring them to a certain location together so you can put together a, a component. So as part of warehousing operation, specifically in picking operations, identification of the parts and their locations can have an impact on the picking speed. So if you know, like for example, if you go to the warehouse for HCV here in San Marcos, you see a lot of, of these operators in a forklift creating uh, or picking objects or product for different stores in the central Texas. So for example, HCV San Marcos will make an order 
and then the, this operator will put together a pallet with all the products that are needed in San Marcos. And this other operator will put together a pallet for products that are needed in Kyle and so on. So they will have this uh, device that will tell them, okay, you have to go pick up now 10 boxes of water. So the device will tell them, okay, this is the right order uh, for picking up. It will take into consideration the distances, but also will take into consideration the weight of, of, the, of the products, or you have to take that into account when picking the, the materials. So you don't wanna go pick, I don't know, a box of bread and then put water on top of it. So, so that's the idea. Uh, so the picking operation, specifically identification of parts and their locations have, can have an impact on the picking speed. So you wanna make sure that you use the time wisely by picking in the right order so you can create these orders um, in an accurate way and also in the less time possible. So the following are the most commonly used mechanisms for communicating picks to order pickers. You have the label picking, you have the pick to light, you have the radio frequency barcode picking, or you have the voice picking. Um, so you will go basically search for products. For example, if you have different colors for each hallway, you know, okay, go to green, go to red, go to yellow hallway, and, and you will find the product in that hallway and, and so on. Uh, so now we get into equipment selection uh, criteria. Um, so how do you select the, the equipment? You have to take into account the material characteristics. Uh, so for example, the physical state, the size, the weight, the shape, the condition, and the safety risk and risk of damage. So for physical state, are you gonna be handling solid, liquid, or gas? Uh, in terms of size, what is the volume, length, width, and height? Weight, shape, again, you get the point. So you, in order to make a decision, you have to be aware of the, the material that you're gonna handle. Um, so here's a good uh, pic picture in terms of decision-making. So it will depend not only on the material, but also in the flow rate and or the quantity of material to be moved and also on the distance for movement. So if you have a no quantity of material to be moved and the distance that you have to move that material is pretty short, then you can use manual handling hand trucks. But if you have a long distance to cover and the quantity of material to be moved is really high, then you can rely on conveyors or AGV trains. And if it is a combination, let's say high in terms of quantity of material to be moved, and short in terms of both distance and the conveyor. If it is long in terms of distance and very low in terms of material to be moved, then the power trucks unit load AGB will be a better option. So this is pretty useful in terms of decision-making uh, in terms of the major categories of equipment for material handling. Um, in terms of flow rate, if we wanna go uh, deeper into the, the type of equipment, so quantity low, distance short, manual hand truck. So this is basically a, a, um, a summary of what we are seeing here. So uh, for high long conveyors, high short conveyor vehicle train, low long power trucks, low short manual hand trucks. Uh, layout type, based on the layout type, we have this fixed position, process, and product. Uh, typical material handling equipment for fixed position includes the cranes, the hoist, and the industrial trucks. For process layout type, you have the hand trucks, the forklift trucks, and the AGVs. And for product, the typical uh, for product layout type, typical material handling includes the conveyors for product flow, trucks to deliver components to stations. Okay, so this is connecting what we learn in terms of the different layout uh, manufacturing types. 
Um, last few slides look at uh, the um, concerns in terms of safety and ergonomics. So we have to be aware of, I mean, even if manual um, handling is the best option, we have to be aware of the requirements in terms of OSHA. So you don't want to put people to uh, live certain ways or outside the, the requirements. So scientific research shows an increase in injuries at certain levels of exposure to heavy, frequent, and upward lifting. Job design is very important in creating a healthy and safe environment, and the selection of proper material handling devices can help with reducing some of the material handling related injuries. So, uh, so if you are in charge of making decisions, you have to pay attention, special attention to these areas, heavy lifting, frequent lifting, and also upward lifting. So if you see this is happening often, most of the time that will lead some type of injuries for your operators, which means that you might have that person out of the uh, production floor because of an injury that will cost you more. So you wanna keep your employees safe. You wanna keep them in, in the job. You wanna keep them in the workplace, uh, having them out ask you to hire a new person, and then you also have to cover the medical expenses of these persons. So very important, not only for the cost perspective, but also for the safety of the employee. Uh, so this is what I was mentioning in terms of OSHA. So there are some specific uh, requirements, and I think this is covered in the work uh, measurement class uh, for industrial engineering, but I'm just reminding you that there's some uh, limitations in terms of how much a person um, can lift, uh, in terms of how many lifts per minute, how many hours per day, and you can compute if it is okay or not based on the Department of Labor and Industries. Uh, so principles for reducing heavy lifting, obviously you can reduce the weight, increase the weight, um, Use mechanical assistance, slide instead of lifting, and then use team lifting for very uh, heavy boxes or product. Um, principles for reducing frequent lifting, use mechanical assistance, avoid unnecessary lifting, and use mobile storage. And upward lifting, remove obstacles, slide closer, reduce shelf depth, reduce package size, use mechanical assistant, and also team lifting. In terms of upward bending, reduce the weight, increase the weight, uh, depending again on, on the type of open that you are doing, use mechanical assistance, slide instead of lift, and team lifting. Um, for reducing upward lifting, above the shoulder, arrange storage, use mechanical assistant, or use a rolling stair or safety ladder. And then uh, principles for reducing upward lifting and twisting, use conveyors, provide more space and arrange storage. If you're not getting all the notes, I will post the, the slides with all the notes after the class. So. Uh, you will have those with you uh, by today. Principle for reducing duration of lifting, rotate the two other jobs. So you have persons rotating on those tasks and also you can use mechanical assistance, which again, goes back to the lecture uh, for today for material handling equipment. Uh, for more information about safety and ergonomics, you can always go to the OSHA.gov uh, website, which everything is stated uh, for protection of the uh, operators and the work environment. Uh, so we want to keep everybody uh, healthy and safe. Uh, and this is the right place to go to get the, the best direction. Uh, so this is a funny, uh, couple of funny pictures here in terms of what things you can see. In, in the actual practical environment. 
so not necessarily the first one. You might not handling that type of, of missile type of product, but you will see things happening. And you, if you are in charge of, of keeping everybody safe, you have to be aware of what's going on and make sure that you have the right protocols in place so uh, accidents can be avoided. Okay, so that's all for, for this lecture. Any, any questions? So if there's no questions, I'll stop here and then we'll continue on Wednesday with uh, a lecture on designing for conveyors. Um, so that will be next. And also I'll bring the, the feedback for the, for the exams. So in this case, for this exam, we don't have a, I'm not gonna bring any papers because the exam was online, but you will see the scores and the feedback online. I'll still discuss the problems in class so in case you have questions, okay? See you on Wednesday.